Hello everyone, uh, thanks for, for coming to this session. Um, so this talk is on what's new with uh, Apache Pinot and LinkedIn and Uber. Um, of all speakers, I'm Yu Peng. I'm an Apache Pinot uh, committer uh, and I lead the Pinot team at Uber. Uh, also in this talk, we have a seat from LinkedIn uh, who is a PMC member of Apache Pinot. Um, so what's Apache Pinot? Uh, Pinot uh, is a distributed columnar uh, sharded data store, uh, and also is designed for high throughput, low latency analytical queries. Uh, you can think of as a real-time OLAP engine. Uh, in addition to real-time, uh, Pinot also supports offline and hybrid uh, workloads, uh, and in some of the database terms you can think of the hybrid is a Lambda architecture. Uh, Pinot is a distributed system and it's designed for fault tolerant high availability, high availability and uh, uh, linear scalability. Uh, both at LinkedIn and Uber, uh, we use Pinot for mission critical use cases uh, and we have um, seen good availability from this system. Pinot is an OLAP engine and it supports standard SQL queries, syntax, and semantics. Uh, for more information, you can look at the link below, uh, which navigates to the Pinot document uh, official site. Uh, originally, Pinot was uh, developed at LinkedIn uh, and contributed to uh, Apache. Uh, from there, it has a really good adoption across the industry. So, not only at Uber, you can see there are multiple uh, like big brand names like Stripe, Walmart that have been used in Pinot. Um, and Pinot has a really good like scaling uh, numbers as you can see on this slide uh, from these companies. So just like a quick uh, high level overview about the Pinot architecture, uh, which is helpful to understand uh, some of the uh, later slides. Uh, so Pino have these uh, three key components uh, and can support both the real-time ingestion. As you can see, the real-time pipelines are from streams like Kafka or Kinesis, uh, and also it support the batch pipeline ingestion uh, from data sets, for example, uh, like Hive or uh, Amazon S3. Uh, look at architecture, one component is the control plane, uh, which is uh, to coordinate the, the different nodes in this overall uh, system. Uh, it's built on top of Helix, which is a cluster management layer over Zookeeper. The data plane is managed by the brokers and the servers. Um, so brokers will take a query and dispatch this to different servers. Uh, and server holds the data and, uh, and answer this query. So it takes a, a scatter and a gather approach uh, for querying. Uh, so in the later slides, we are going to introduce the new features that in the past few years that we developed both LinkedIn and Uber and highlight some of the interesting use cases uh, that these are uh, uh, both companies. Uh, so, uh, in the previous Apache Khan, we talked about um, Pinot. So these are like to show some uh, uh, latest like developments. So for the first uh, feature we contribute from Uber is uh, on the geospatial. Um, for Uber's business by nature, it's highly real time and also uh, geospatial data relevant. So every day, they are like uh, drivers, riders, eaters, merchants, lots of data are collected and uh, important insights are derived from those. Uh, so to make this uh, insights more powerful from the real-time analysis, uh, Uber did the uh, contribution to Apache Pinot. Um, so particularly um, we did this in uh, last year. And when we contribute this feature, we try to make the geospatial support to be uh, ISO SQL compliant. There's a, a standard called like MM uh, on SQL. So this reflects on both not only the data model on the geospatial part, but also the, um, the geospatial functions 
are also compliant to the standard. Uh, in addition to this, we also build the geospatial index uh, to accelerate uh, many geospatial queries. Uh, this is because geospatial uh, query are usually expensive. Uh, using the geospatial index can greatly improve the query performance. So this index is built on top of uh, a grading library from Uber called H3, which is also an uh, open source library. Um, the idea is that to uh, grade the, the, um, the geospace uh, with high scans. Uh, for example, we can see the diagram below that for each uh, high scan, it has uh, six neighbors and all the neighbors are equal distance. So such a nice property can greatly simplify uh, many, ge many geospatial uh, computation and calculation. And there are also like different resolutions of the disk which are useful to approximate like complex shapes. Like for example, like this is how we use H3 to approximate uh, California on the right. So for the geospatial, uh, uh, support. The fourth thing we added is a uh, geospatial data types. Um, unlike the uh, the standard like typing system in SQL, uh, geospatial actually has a complex hierarchy. As you can see, there are like edges like points, curves, polygons, um, and we uh, add the geospatial types uh, include as bytes in Pnode but we have the full support uh, of the hierarchy. Uh, in the engine at the core, we reuse open source library called uh, GTS, which is also a popular library adopted by other open source compute frameworks like Progress, JS, and also a GeoSpark. Uh, to learn more about these geotypes, you can take a look at the link, which navigates to um, Pnode uh, open source documentation. Um, so this is a good example on how you can express this uh, geospatial types uh, uh, using the functions. And for speaking of the geospatial functions, uh, we make this like uh, as a uh, ISO standard compliant, and all the functions will have as IST underscore prefix. I stands for spatial and T stands for temporal. So here just give us you. Uh, some examples to show what kind of functions are like you can calculate distance between two points and calculate like area uh, of a polygon and if you want to read more about this information you can navigate to the uh, the user docs um also want to highlight the uh, h3 based algorithm um as you can see uh, the algorithm idea is a bit uh, actually straightforward. So instead of like scanning all the data points uh, over the board, we can actually um, pick um, the uh, nearby data points that's within this high scan, right? And the algorithm uh, takes from uh, finding all the high scan fully contained in this area, and then we can reduce the data points to be evaluated uh, using this function. So to highlight a real use case of this, uh, so re uh, recently we published an engineering blog and highlight uh, this uh, crossover, which is like a uh, color orders near you. Uh, it's an application running in the uh, Uber is application. It's on the homepage, if you scroll down, uh, you can see this uh, crossover. So originally this application was launched uh, using Cassandra, which is the uh, persistent store for to store all the Uber Eats orders. Um, but because of the design for each incoming user request, it has to make more than 100 calls to Cassandra, uh, which is now very efficient use of the storage system and results in a uh, 60 uh, time increase of capacity uh, if we need to uh, use Cassandra as a storage. And the team uh, built a solution uh, using Pnode. Uh, as you can see, this uh, finding nearby orders can be simply described using this SQL query, right? Uh, so you take your current point of Uber Eats user, and you run this function uh, to find all the uh, data points 
nearby uh, on using both the geo condition and the time condition. So this greatly simplified uh, the application part of building and also improved the, the quality performance uh, by a good uh, extent. And next, I'm going to move to another uh, interesting feature contributed by Uber, uh, which also fundamentally changed the, uh, the data model part of Pnode. It's called Upsert. So Upsert is actually a pretty common operation in the database, right? So um, before Pnode uh, is built as an immutable store, that means as you ingest events from the real-time stream, data are keep uh, appended. And this feature, uh, we allow people to correct data or update it. Um, and this is pretty important um, because as I show you in this example, that if you want to show a live dashboard to see um, some uh, aggregates of your you know, Uber Eats and a group by the orders, order status, uh, you want to know how many are live now, how many are delivered, and how many are created. Uh, without absurd, it will be very challenging to get this information. But with absurd, um, we can use this single query to show uh, to this with the group by of current status. So there are a lot of uh, use cases can be enabled by this feature. Uh, so it's a actually great addition to the penal uh, feature capabilities. Um, however, this is a pretty challenging uh, feature to take on. Uh, one of the reasons is that uh, on the storage part, we still keep Pinot as a immutable uh, like a storage. Um, so this is pretty common for a system that based on like SL, uh, LSM like architecture uh, for good quality performance. Um, and with this setup, the key challenge becomes on how do we establish the uh, relationship and connection among the records of the same primary key, right? It's like a, a lineage problem that you have to update something, you have to find out what to be updated. And then you want to uh, disable that record from your query results. So a naive approach on this is to uh, establish this global like uh, relationship like for example, like given a primary key P1, the record can be on like server one or server two, right? Um, and also like on like server four. But once you have updates coming in that you want to update this record, uh, these segments by default can be on other servers. So how do you define, get this a uh, global coordination, uh, which is very challenging for uh, distributed systems especially for the real-time uh, distribution systems. So we take this approach from a, a different angle and trying to reduce this to a local coordination problem. Uh, so the idea is that if you can like partition the data by key, uh, which is an important feature in the Kafka stream, um, then that means all the records of the same primary key are grouped um, on the same server and um, so that this become like a local computation problem, right? So that means all the records of primary key P1 are going to be like on like server one uh, and server two. Then we can derive the, this lineage uh, using the local computation and greatly solve the uh, important display problem. So taking this idea, the architecture shows uh, like this. Um, so uh, once you have an incoming uh, Kava topic, uh, we want to use some partitioner. Uh, in this example, we use a flink to part reach partition the data and to shuffle the data within the Kava stream and then um, group the events by the primary key and output to another Kava topic. And then from this topic, we ingest this to the Pino servers. So for each of the Pino server, it will have all the records of same primary key. Uh, on the server side, we added a few new components. Uh, there's like a local observed key metadata store doing the coordination. 
and then we add a data structure called like skip doc filter. It's a beam map based uh, filter so that we know which documents are invalidated because they are updated, right? And then we use this to mask all those uh, documents uh, on, the, on, the, on the server side. So a couple of words about this uh, progress of this feature. Uh, originally, we attempted this, you know, long time ago, like almost like um, three years ago. Uh, and initial approach trying to take the global coordination problem, uh, which turned out to be very complex and results in a lot of scalability challenges. And then we really this problem and did a redesign using this uh, local coordination approach. And this time, the uh, because of the simplification of the architecture, uh, we made a very good progress uh, on this. So within a couple of months, we added this feature and released uh, this in Pino point six. Uh, you can find out some of the uh, links here that on the release notes and on the design documentation. Um, we are also made a follow up development on this, uh, which is called like partial upsurge. So that for changes, you do not have to have the full payload of the entire row, but can only uh, like describe what value to be changed on select columns, and you can ignore the others. It's called like a partial upsurge. Uh, so we just made a contribution into the Pino main trunk, and this will be released in 0.8. Um, so give you a quick example to see what this is like uh, running upsurge. So we want to select from the uh, its, all, uh, its orders and are interested in one particular like ID. So before the officer can see the full history of this order from created it to assign some drivers and then this will become pickup. Uh, with absurd, we only show the latest status um, of this. All right, so now I will pass this to Sid uh, to talk about the awesome feature developed by LinkedIn. Okay, thanks, Yuping. Uh, yeah, hi guys, I'm Sid, uh, and I'll be talking about a couple of features that were contributed to Pino by LinkedIn and how they are being used at LinkedIn in production. So the first is the text search support in Pino. So to set some context about text search, uh, let's just go over how an exact match search operation happens in Pino. Uh, and let's say you have a, a column called as first name in your table, right? And there is no index in the table and you have a simple query where you want to count the number of rows in the table where first name is John, right? So uh, the Pino segment has a data structure called as dictionary. And dictionary basically is essentially the length of the cardinality of the column. So there are as many values in the dictionary as the number of unique values in the first name column so first we basically look up the dictionary to find the dictionary id of john and the dictionary is sorted to structure so we do a binary search in this case the dictionary id is two and then we scan another data structure in the pino segment called as uh, forward index and the for uh, we basically scan the forward index row by row and as in where the dictionary ID two is matching, those rows are getting selected. So this, so since this is an exact match search operation, and since there is uh, no index, uh, we basically end up scanning the entire table. Okay, so now let's see uh, how the exact match search uh, happens uh, if there is an inverted index, right? So it's the same setup. You have the first name column in your table, right, and this time you have an inverted index on this column so let's say the user is interested in the same query uh, wants to find out the number of rows where the first name is john right uh, we the, the steps are same you first look up the dictionary using binary search to find john's dictionary id right and then you scan you basically instead of scanning the forward index we do a, a lookup in the inverted index on uh, where the key is the dictionary ID. So we look up the dictionary ID two, and we get a bitmap of doc IDs, right? And so that's that's it. That's the that's the answer, right? We don't end up scanning the forward index row by row, right? And the inverted index helps us fulfill this query with multiple orders of magnitude faster, right? 
So this is how exact match search operation happens in Pino without index and with inverted index. Now, let's say uh, the user is not interested in doing exact match. User is interested in doing a bit of arbitrary text search, right? Uh, so in this case, the user is interested in finding out, uh, counting all the rows from the table where the first name starts with John. So it's a prefix query, right? Uh, and to support these kind of operations, Pino has exposed a function called as regexp like, uh, and the processing is more or less the same. So in this case, what happens is that uh, you first, since there is no index, right? So you have to do a scan. So we first scan the dictionary and for each unique raw, uh, valid raw value that we have in the dictionary, right? Uh, we, we get the raw value, right? From the dictionary. Then we do a Java regex based pattern match of the raw value with the regex uh, that is uh, uh, specified in the, the, the query function. Right, and we find out all the matching dictionary ID set. Then um, we scan the forward index data structure and count the number of records uh, with the diction uh, with the dictionary ID part of the matching set. Right, because each cell value in the forward index is a dictionary ID, so we just need to check: okay, is this dictionary belonging to the matching set that we computed in the set? To is this dictionary ID part of the matching set? So that's how we do an arbitrary text search when there is no index. So the key uh, takeaway here is that indexes are not used to evaluate regex filters and we use scan. Okay, so now uh, how do we actually make this operation efficient, right? How do we run the text search uh, operations efficiently? So mostly when the arbiter the text data is arbitrary, let's say you have like uh, textual blobs, right? Or blobs where each column value is like a heterogeneous text we uh, need more than exact matches. Uh, users are mostly interested in doing regex queries or phrase queries. Uh, phrases are basically multiple terms combined in the same order or fuzzy edit distance like uh, queries on your textual data. In addition, they also need the ability to easily compose a single complex Boolean search expression consisting of one or more kind of uh, text searches like regexes, phrases, etc., etc. So the existing function, which uh, I showed in the previous slide, regexp like, has a couple of issues. First is the poor latency uh, because it uses scan without, and there is no index, right? And so most queries time out during execution when filtering large amounts of data. And the other drawback is that uh, regexp like is based on the Java regex syntax. So it is very non-trivial to compose a single complex Boolean search expression, let's say you, where you have like, five, 10, or even maybe hundreds of clauses, which we have seen in production. So then writing that in a regex query uh, is get easily gets non-trivial and less usable for the user. So to solve these issues and make the text search super efficient, we added support for text indexes uh, in the 0.3.2 release of Pino. So let's quickly go over the performance of a text search query uh, without, with, without and with the index. So here we have taken the sample data set of size 500 million rows and filter selectivity of uh, 150 million. So in, by filter selectivity, I imply that how many rows are going to pass the filter. So it's that's 150 million. And as you can see, the text search without scan, without scan with scan, with, right, takes about eight minutes. And then with index, it takes about two seconds. So it is definitely like multiple orders of magnitude faster uh, than the scan query. So the text search support in Pino was contributed by LinkedIn. Uh, it is supported on string columns for both offline and real-time tables. So uh, you can use your text search on batch uploaded uh, data, or you can do a real-time text search. Uh, it is uh, heavily used in production at LinkedIn for keyword-based search on LinkedIn Talent Insights platform. So LinkedIn Talent Insights platform is, uses Pino to compute various talent related metrics uh, and uh, allows the users of the platform to understand various macro trends uh, across the different talent pools and understand the talent landscape and basically define a high hiring strategy. Now the users of this platform, they wanted some flexibility to be able to uh, construct broader searches and generate wider variety of uh, the talent pool metrics, 
right, and uh, be able to uh, define a better hiring strategy. Now, the text search feature that is added in Pino uh, allows the uh, LinkedIn Talent Insights users to search for pretty much any text on a LinkedIn member profile. The text could be in your skill sets, it could be in your description, or it could be in your title, could be anywhere. And with this free form text search, they are able to analyze the talent pools for different emerging skill sets, tools, technologies. And they are also able to uh, put together very complex Boolean searches very easily and uh, analyze and isolate various kind of uh, uh, talent pools. And the users of this platform have described this uh, ability to be or to be able to do free text search uh, on the profile along with the standardized search which has already been there right as a game changer for the talent analytics so it has really improved uh, the user experience and and their hiring strategy okay so now uh, how do you really use text search in pino so it's uh, it's a part of our standard sql query syntax uh, so let's say we have a let's say we create a table with two columns uh, one column basically has a pino broker query log where each column value is a line from the query log and then another column which where each column value is the candidate's profile or resume and we can store both the columns as string type and enable text index now we the first query could be to count the number of queries in the log file that have let's say between filter on time column and they use group by so let's say you want to do this kind of text search analysis then it's simple right you just do select pound star and then we have exposed this function called as text match added to our sql grammar specify the first argument as the column on which you have text index and then your search expression so as you can see it is you know, fairly straightforward to compose a a boolean search expression then let's say you are interested in finding the number of candidates that have skills machine learning gp processing and maybe one of distributed systems or tensorflow so again it becomes like a, a boolean search expression uh, and standard syntax of using and or etc uh, you, you can compose uh, any length or size of a search expression uh, next, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, how uh, you can use theta sketches uh, for a different way of doing approximate distinct counting in Pino. So, so let's say uh, what is really distinct count here, right? Uh, so common use, it's a very common use case in the OLAP queries to count the number of unique values in a column. Uh, right, let's say you, you have a column, let's say, I don't know, uh, number ID or something, or right, and you want to uh, find out the number of unique values, and you may have a group by on one or more other dimension columns. Now, Pino SQL provides multiple functions for unique counting. The first is your accurate count, where we have provided this distinct count aggregation function, uh, which uh, gives you a very accurate count of the number of unique values in the column. Now, as the cardinality of the column is, high, is increased or if the volume of the data is high, then this operation becomes very memory intensive as well as, uh, as, well as um, the latency increases for the query. So then we have another alternatives with, for approximate counting. So hyperlog log is a commonly used data structure in databases uh, and it trades off uh, uh, memory footprint uh, and performance for approximation. So the query uses lower memory footprint, right? And a better performance, but the result is approximate. So it is not accurate. Then we uh, also added a, a third variant of approximate count, uh, which is called as distinct count theta sketch. And this uses Apache data sketches sketch library. The key difference between uh, this and the distinct count HLL is that uh, this also supports your set based operations like union intersection and things like that so this feature was contributed uh, to pino by linkedin it is used in production uh, uh, for a audience reach estimation use case like where let's say you given a targeting advertising criteria right uh, the businesses want to estimate the reach of an advertising campaign. They want to find out the, the number of uh, members 
uh, that this advertising campaign will reach, right? And these insights are surfaced to these uh, users via LinkedIn campaign manager product, uh, it, where the users can de define their targeting criteria and the targeting criteria can be defined on the basis of uh, member attributes. For example, you can define a targeting criteria, uh, let's say for members who live in either US or Canada, they work for LinkedIn and they know Java C++, Java or C++. And you can create an advertising campaign for this and then use this audience reach estimation use case to find out the estimated reach for your campaign. Now, what is a targeting criteria? It's essentially a logical combination of various conditions and each condition represents a set of members. Okay, the set of members in USA, a set of members in Canada, a set of members that have worked for LinkedIn, set of members that know Java, right? So then audience reach uh, estimation problem uh, essentially boils down to finding the unique count of members in the intersection of these multiple sets, uh, right? Uh, so then, the initial working solution uh, that we came up with basically was a distinct count based aggregation for unique member counting right and uh, our source of production table uh, had was pre-aggregated to reduce the number of rows so as you can see in the schema we had various dimensions like your country skills which is a multi-value column and many other attributes and industry and then the count which is the number of members with that particular dimension combination uh, the challenges here were that since the some of many of the columns dimension columns are multi-valued right and high cardinality along with the constant addition of uh, new attributes plus the, with the organic growth and membership we saw uh, linear increase growth in the table size secondly uh, every day the entire you know data table data is refreshed essentially overwritten with newly generated member data and this uh, growing data volume along with daily refreshes just increase the data push latency and uh, put the data freshness SLAs of uh, customers into an acceptable uh, range. And so, so that those were the key challenges around with our initial solution of simple distinct count based query. And as you can see, the SQL query is uh, fairly straightforward, right? Here, you can use the select some count from table where country in US, Canada, and your skills in Java C++ and company equal to LinkedIn. So you're basically just computing, uh, just doing a sum count on the pre-aggregated uh, data, right? So now uh, in order to uh, tackle these challenges, we had to rethink the data schema, first of all, to reduce the data set size and also be able to uh, improve the data freshness SLAs. Uh, for the customer. So we uh, started exploring approximate distant count solutions. Uh, the first one we explored was the distant count HLM. Uh, now hyperlog log, uh, as I mentioned, scales well lower memory footprint, uh, better performance. But the, uh, the main problem over there as far as functionality is concerned is that it does not support set intersection operations. Uh, so that's why, and we, and as I mentioned, right, we needed to uh, be able to intersect uh, the, the member IDs belonging to different sets for uh, for an advertising criteria, and so that's why we started exploring this uh, theta sketch based solution. So similar to hyperlog log, theta sketch is again a very probabilistic data structure, uh, doing uh, the time for optimized for time space trade off, right? And it is a solution for approximate distinct count, just like uh, hyperlog log, uh, but supports uh, the intersection. So what we did is that we pre-computed a serialized sketch for each member dimension value, right? Uh, let's say it is uh, USA, countries, country equal to USA or skill equal to Java, right? And then we stored that as a bytes blob in the Pino table. And our new schema has three columns, um, which I will show in the coming slide. And this led to a very, very drastic reduction in the data size, improving the data push latency and the data freshness SLAs. Also, one other benefit of this solution is that um, because even if let's say you're adding uh, members, right, or you're adding member dimensions, the schema of the table doesn't have to change. So our new schema is essentially, you have first column as the dimension name, let's say country, company, skill, right? The second column is the corresponding dimension value. And then the last column is the serialized uh, sketch, which is essentially a bytes uh, data structure comprising of all the member, member representing a set of member ids belonging to that particular 
dimension. Right? So now how does the execution happen? Servers essentially compute the union of all qualifying sketches for the where clause. So the where clause will look like a standard. You, you, don't, you want to do a union, so you want to do, okay, where the dimension name is country, right, and dimension value is USA. So it will select the sketch for this condition. And you combine with or, okay, you want to look at, okay, dimension name is company, right, and uh, dimension value is LinkedIn. So then the union, the, all the union of these sketches will be selected by the server. Then at the end, we want to do an intersection, right, or any other set operation for that matter. So we want to provide that set operation as expression to the aggregation function. And then the Pinot broker computes the set operation on the resulting sketch. And, th and that's how it estimates the set intersection cardinality. Uh, the brief insight into the performance that we were able to achieve. So the P95 query latency was around 800 milliseconds for 20 qubits. So now, as you can see, uh, how has the query changed? We have introduced the distinct count theta sketch based aggregation function in the query right and you have provided a, a set operation as an argument to the function and the, as you can see here we are using and uh, so in, so that means the broker will compute an intersection over the unionized sketches that are sent by the server and then the same where clause for the union uh, that that is mentioned above for the server execution so that's what the new query looks like with, on the new schema and with theta sketch based uh, execution so that is pretty much for the text search and the theta sketches uh, over the last couple of years uh, linkedin uber and many other open source contributors in the community have contributed several other features uh, to pino uh, some of them being like we have moved on to uh, being standard sql compliant syntax and semantics as far as the query language is concerned uh, we also added support for uh, um, a, one particular variant of join called as lookup join and then we had a support for json json indexes having clauses uh, a lot of uh, work on, on the type of functions like transforms during ingestion and post aggregation functions killer functions so these are the kind of features that we have added and many more over the last couple of years and here is a link that we have given to our release notes uh, for, for for the open source apache release then here we have given references to a couple of blog posts that we have written the first is the blog post that recently came out by linkedin uh, on how when the tech search uh, is powering the linkedin talent insights use case uh, in in production then the second one is basically going into the lot of internal details and of design details and implementation for tech search and we have also a blog post on the theta sketches and how it is used in production for the uh, audience reach estimation use case. We have a couple of nice blog posts uh, by Uber on the geospatial indexes and how it is solving a key production problem. Uh, uh, Yuping is giving a talk next week at the Kafka Summit on uh, how is Upsource solving the real-time analytics problem. And then lastly, we have a link to the Pino user docs. Um, that is uh, pretty much. Uh, thanks a lot.